Hello, everyone. Welcome to Market Invention Series. We're going to keep doing this. Excited to have everyone with me. Uh, my name is Adam Vasquez. I will be your host or teacher or educator today. And uh, we're going to be jumping in and talking about how to map market opportunities. Uh, Last in the series, last time in the series, we talked about just a general overview of market invention. Kind of just talked about what it was. We'll revisit some of those key points for those who are just joining us for this market opportunity presentation. But I'm super excited because for the first time, this hasn't been internal training for our team at Merit, and I've edited some things, updated some things, and now I'm so excited to be able to present it to all of you. So that's what we're gonna to do today. We're going to go through this. We've got an hour together. If we go a little bit over, great. If it's a little bit under, uh, great, even better. Give you your time back. Uh, but it's gonna be exciting because we're gonna dive in on how to identify a market opportunity. And you know, this methodology of broader market invention, this is a piece of identifying the market opportunity within that, and we'll get into that. But it's not just about uh, businesses. This is about individuals as well. This is a great, great tool for helping you to find a new business idea or even an opportunity for yourself inside another company. Now, um, it, and, and with that being said, just think about this for, for use of two ways, either personally for your personal brand or for your company or business brand, or just an idea that uh, you're gonna create something new, or you could be even using this to advise other clients. Our, our intellectual property is out here, out there now. We believe in, at Merit, we believe in open source, that everybody is a student of this, and we really just wanna help everybody get to their market opportunity and vet markets faster. So all you market inventors, uh, be ready for some exciting stuff and we're gonna dive in and this is gonna be a very working presentation. So I'll be moving in and out of different slides and everything else. So hopefully the technology will, will participate with me and we can co-create this together. So, so let's just jump right in. You know, so mapping the market opportunity, we talk about the market invention life cycle and the sort of four stages and think of this market invention as a foundation or framework uh, or frame for the market you're inventing, but more importantly, if you're a marketer. A lot of times marketers just jump into the tactics, meaning, oh, let's what's our social media campaign? What do we got to do for search strategy? Oh, I got to create, create content. And, and really the key issue is they haven't built a framework around that so that when you do do social media or any of those other marketing tactics, they're really driving home the market and building a platform for you and your community coming together. And again, let's remind everybody what is a market. A market is a group of people coming together to solve pain based on a shared belief. Um, and, and with that, we're going to identify that pain together today. Because as marketers, it's our role to identify the opportunity and to potentially the pain, but really educate and recruit and bring that fragmented market or those fragmented belief systems together into one consolidated group so that everybody can win and we get to a, a, a better future together. So again, a reminder just for those who are new, and learning this for the first time, or just a refresher for those who have done this multiple times, you know, there's four stages, and and I would say life cycle. Think of it as as stages of maturity, um, not necessarily a hard line process. You kind of know where you are with each of these steps. And the first one is market opportunity. So we're going to dive in on how to do that, um, and then future future episodes, we'll get into the invention strategy, how to make the market and then lead the market and all the nuances in between. So again, if you're if you're here and watching us on YouTube, please comment, ask questions. I, you, I am here to answer your questions. And uh, if you've had challenges with this, uh, those who have used this in the past, we just want to have that conversation. So Please feel free to chat. And if you don't chat, I will keep talking and we'll keep moving. There is a lag, so just be aware. Uh, when you send your chat, it may be delayed to get to me, but I promise I will respond and I will I will try my best to answer your questions. So jumping in, 
let's just jump into how to do the market opportunity. So, so what is a market opportunity? And I'm going to remove myself from the screen so you can see everything. It it's really the beginning of what is the opportunity. It's the asking the question, and you can start a market opportunity in a couple of ways. I I generally like to say that you should should talk about it from a hypothesis that you may have. Maybe the idea, an idea that may be your starting point, which you can kind of work backwards to, um, or it's if it's an existing business where you, you know, you're in the industry and you're not really making headway and you're not changing the conversation, uh, that's a way to start with a hypothesis. But the hypothesis really is, I, you know, I believe I could have an impact on this by doing this, you know, and, and here is potentially the pain or whatever. And, and usually for entrepreneurs, we're most successful entrepreneurs, not all that are successful, but most successful entrepreneurs have, have a tendency to solve something that bothers them, right? That they kind of personify that central pain and we'll get into that, uh, but other times when you're working for another company, when that pain is already being addressed and you get hired, especially as a marketer or an operator or, or the CEO itself, you know, it, it's really getting comfortable with understanding the pain still and how that's evolving and how you may and where is the industry shifting. Um, and, and again, industries are always shifting. The trick is not to uh, let it shift under your feet while you're not paying attention. So so with that market opportunity, it always starts with once you have an idea of, of maybe the industry you're looking at, maybe uh, a certain pain that you think you can solve or whatnot, is the sort of data audit. And data audit is, you know, for more for established businesses, it's like, what do you have? Like, what kind of data in, is out there already? And really, that's what you want to start with, just collecting as much data if it's an existing company as possible. And the data audit really applies to mostly to existing businesses and, and enterprises. Now, the research itself, because this is where a lot of the research starts, and I'll get into each of these areas when we get there, but you're going to be researching uh, individuals, potential buyers, people that have the issues today. You're going to be looking at your strengths personally. You're going to be looking at competition. Again, I am a karmic capitalist, so I do not believe in competition as competition. I believe it as collaboration. But from a lack of a better term, it's what the other businesses that are not yours are doing, right? And then we're going to look at influencers and then and the key differences of those and, of course, the mega trends also. Some of this will be in different orders as we go through this. Uh, actually, we'll start off with the mega trends, but that's how we go. And then what happens is you kind of we're mapping it. So we'll identify everything, we'll map it, and we'll get into some sizing and analysis on additional episodes uh, following this. Really wanted to stay in this episode on the mapping exercise itself because that in itself is the core, and then we can go from there. And then you see a creative brief. Well, the creative brief is you know, many ways, an internal thing for merit. However, I recommend everybody d does this and there's examples and, and we'll dive into that and, and hopefully bring on our, our chief creative officer to talk about that or chief strategy officer to talk about the, the creative brief. But the creative brief is just a, um, a, a sum a summary of, of everything about the market opportunity, which allows a group of people to then move into the invention strategy. So think of it as a, a central communication tool that allows us to visualize and expand on what we find in the opportunity itself. All right. So just, just refreshing everyone, let's just keep going. So again, want to remind everybody that pain is central, you know, a, an individual at a a speaking engagement I had at the ILA conference, International Leadership Association conference, was like, Adam, instead of pain, can we say it's hope? And I love that. I love calling it hope, but but pain is gets it an emotional, um, it, it gets, there, there's an added emotion to it that is, again, it's a negative, a fear-based, what have you, but generally speaking, uh, for most people, pain is the requirement for change. Um, hope for me is hope, but, uh, but for most people it is pain. And, and I think that's just why we keep it there. 
Um, but it is about pain. And, and again, all markets reflect the leader's belief system. So we really got to start with the pain at the core. And if you're an existing business, a lot of the pain we're going to be discovering is sometimes we ask the question of what is the pain? What are the key issues you have with using the incumbent software? Um, that could be a question. But but my only point here is just to reinforce that the market is around a belief system. It is centered around pain, people, training, culture, the processes, the products, the languages. If you invent the market, all of those become variations or derivatives of your original blueprint and the people you hired because they move companies and people like industry expertise. So what happens is uh, uh, basically you end up repeating in, in, in bring, you know, bringing the same belief systems into your company from the previous uh, leaders because you're hiring people from their experience in the industry and with their processes, their products and all that baggage with that. Not saying that it's bad to have industry experience. I think that's critical. But in this process, we're looking at market opportunity. We're really trying to hold off our or or mute our industry uh, expert mind because what it will do is we will limit the opportunities that you identify because you're going to be going through a feasibility of in our industry, you can't do this or in our industry, we can't do this. And what that does is it ends up hurting your, your ideas. So, so turn off your industry expert mind. It is not effective in this process. And really uh, other than identifying media companies, people that are making, having conversations that were, or where to research basically. Um, uh, but beyond that, it will hurt you in this process. So industry experts, I'm sorry, this uh, isn't for you. Uh, and if you want to use this, obviously you should, but do not let your industry knowledge get in your own way for innovation. Okay, moving on. All right. So what we see here is our, I like to call this a pain grid. And I'll explain this to you. This is a simple worksheet. You can download this. Uh, you know, it certainly we'll have opportunities to download it. If you've read Toothfish, uh, you know, the, the links to tooth for on Toothfish at the end of the book, obviously take you to the pain grid and other uh, deliverables and other templates you can download. Um, and if you don't, you know, just drop Merit a line, contact us at Merit or uh, look me up on LinkedIn, Adam Vasquez, and shoot me a note. And I'd be happy to send this to you. But basically, this is a worksheet. So you're going to, we're going to scribble all over this and everything we can but this is a heat map also so if anyone nobody's familiar with the heat map is basically overlaying the trend you're seeing where the overlap the size the magnitude of the frequency or the demand or the interest on those items or the revenue what have you and they expand it shows you visually also where there's opportunities and where they're not and i'm a big believer in 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 visuals and because i'm a visual learner and I believe most people require visuals. And this allows you not only to put the data in, but quickly see and realize where there's gaps in the pain. So let's talk about the pain grid a little bit more before we start using it. On the left, you have these sort of outside influences, right? I would say on the outside is the mega trends. And the mega trends is just that mega trends. We're not interested in industry trends. We'll uncover the industry trends in, in the middle section uh, under the pain when we start looking at competitors and influencers and such. But so the mega trends, and we'll get into that in a bit, but they are the general big things, right? COVID was a mega trend. Deglobalization is another one. Uh, you could argue Web3 is a mega trend. These are trends that span multiple industries. And, and megatrends are important because leveraging megatrends is all about timing. So it ensures a little bit better on timing because the megatrend, you let the megatrend do the work of communicating the value. So when, so when you produce a solution that's aligned with a megatrend for, uh, for a customer, they automatically, you don't have to teach them everything about what's behind this, right? So they can get it fairly quickly because there's a lot of other conversation going on that's that they see every day. So this is the big news cycle stuff. Now in the middle is a lot of the working area and and 
you know, the, the circles in the top left, that's the number of, of, of answers that, that, that came through people that answered these tops and the top line will put in the actual pain themes and, uh, and I'll explain that. And then in the middle underneath of those pain themes, we're going to be mapping what competitors are saying as well as influencers and media and what, where they are will be, uh, basically overlaid over what, who's talking about these pains, right? These pain points. And then strengths is your strengths. It's is, and we'll get into the, each of these areas again, but strengths is um, what you're good at, uh, what connections you have, that kind of stuff. So again, we'll go through this. We're about ready to go through this in, per, in, in each step by step, but I wanted to give you an overview. And this is just something that eventually you get good at this. You can kind of run this through in your own mind and, and kind of bounce ideas off with yourself and quickly kind of go through this. Because I'm, I'm a big believer in tools like this that allow your thinking process, your critical thinking. So this will help your critical thinking and it will also uh, take what's in your head and put it down on paper for other people to see. This can be, this certainly should be a group exercise, but it, it can absolutely be done by, used by yourself. Um, if you're a solopreneur or a startup, or if you're just the only marketing person in the building, right? So again, this is really good at identifying market opportunities for markets we want to invent, products, innovations. It's also really good for um, content, right? So this is great for content marketers because what it does is it identifies topics that people aren't talking about. And I'll, I'll show you more on that. And, and, and I recommend anybody who's in the content marketing should be using this because if they're not, they're really just throwing, you know, they have no idea of the landscape. This allows you to get a, a clear picture of the landscape. So with that, let's, let's get right into the mega trends. So again, the mega trends. So a couple things here. When we're thinking about the pain, we do need to understand who our customer is and who are we talking to? Who's the buyer? So right here, I have the, the role is the CIO in blue. This is you know chief in, in information officer, IT director, what have you in IT, whoever's responsible for that. It's not chief innovation officer, although there's some overlap in some companies, but really the CIO is, a, is, is the target here when we're going to go through this. And and you know, I, I quickly just outlined, and again, I filled out all of these just to kind of speed things up, but and I and I'll I'll walk you through how we get there. But but look, if we look here, you know, I've put in pandemics, inclusion and diversity, artificial intelligence, web three, fourth turning. What the fourth turning is is a demographic shift that happens every 80 years uh, in each of the, the nations. And we're at the end of an 80 year cycle, which there's change. There's uh, a lot of disruption happening. Central governments and central large institutions lose favor. Um, it, it's something worth noticing and it's a demo, major demographic uh, mega trend, I would argue. There's deglobalization, but that's like decentralization. And that's tied, I would say, to fourth turning. ESG, and that's environmental sustainability and governance. That's the green stuff. And then I will move my picture so you can see, and that's cybersecurity on the bottom. Now, there are way more than these. And, and these are, you can kind of, you can use whatever words you want to to describe the trend. I, there's not a rule here. I think there are some elitists out there that will say, well, this is the mega trend. That's not, as long as you get the essence of it, that's all that matters, right? That's all that matters. So, and, and we will use these mega trends because these mega trends, if you're a PR person or content marketer, these are the mega trends that the media companies want you to be able to talk about with your solution. So again, it's timing. It's about being relevant. It's about be, you're aligning what you're doing to a bigger conversation. So, so it's a really quick trick to be able to identify in some of these. And, and there's plenty of ways to get out there. So let's, I'm going to, I'm going to go on the internet right now here and just show you um, kind of where, where to find mega trends. So, so when we think about, uh, you know, you can click in here anything say say 20 2030 or 2022 mega trends and you will be surprised on how much really good 
information is out there, right? The World World Economic Forum has put stuff out. Uh, lots of consultant consultancy uh, program management institute has has put in here, and and if you you can look up images. If we look at the the PMI one. You know, you've got digital disruption, climate crisis, demographic shifts, things that we talked about, fourth turning here, economic shifts, labor shortages. The, the, the issue here, a couple of things when you're looking at megatrends, be aware that you are, anytime you research a megatrend, you're looking at it through the lens of that company. So they have a embedded conflict of interest, meaning they're going to tweak these mega trends that make this seem that their product or service is the one to address the mega trends. Okay. You know, much like we're, we're doing, you know, these, these marketers and these companies are doing something similar. Just be aware. Um, you know, just, just be aware. Buyer beware. Uh, other mega trends is the world in 2050. Check your sources um, for here. This is just a group of companies that put this together. Exponential technology radically reshaping the world. They call it, you know, technologies as a mega trend. I, you know, I would not call that a mega trend. I think blockchain, which is Web three, we talk about, is is a mega trend. AI, quantum, machine learning, robots. That's the AI piece. Um, equality of access. That's inclusion and diversity. Um, the demographics shifts, they talk about the, the, the great resignation, the fact that we call the silver tsunami. And if, for, for those who are not familiar with silver tsunami, silver tsunami is the, the baby boomers aging out and uh, retiring in masses. Ernst and Young's got some really good ones as well. Um, decarbonization, that's the green behavioral economy, synthetic media, Future of thinking. See, see, see. Ernst Young EY is is branding their mega trends, and and you can see it right because they're in some ways they're trying to invent markets, but they don't quite understand how to right because they're trying to say, well, these are the trends. The mega trends are the generic. Everybody shares them, that type of thing. Now, market invention. If you do it right, you can become a mega trend in yourself. But most successful market inventions are focused on industry, creating industry trends. Um, doesn't mean you can't. Uh, you can. This process works creating a massive mega trend as well. But mega trends are generally societal, economic, uh, e ecological, and you know, environmental. These geopolitical, um, the socioeconomic sort of level sort of trends that are impacting all of us. The internet is a mega trend, obviously. So, so as we as we think about it, it just gives you a point on, on looking. There's so many different mega trends: shifting economic, climate change, and you can start to see um, all of again. This is BlackRock's website that we're on here, and even industry sites will get into what they are. Right. So, technology, traditional consumers, goods produced by technology companies, the global economy should grow. As the world becomes more productive, you know, rapid urbanization. You know, that it's it's funny because you you would argue that it might be going the other way, right? With instead of rapid urbanization, it's that whole decentralized people moving out of the cities into the suburbs because of the teleworking in COVID, um, and that trend hasn't quite changed yet. Uh, it's not the influx that 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 everybody seems to think exists. Um, and and so there's there's a bunch of stuff out there. So anyways, so this is how you would align your mega trends, right? And now I am going to flip back to the presentation as we're building them out. So when you're looking at mega trends again, you do want to take the lens of the idea, the hypothesis that you're going to go after. If you have one, if you don't look at them generically and look at them like, wow, that's interesting. I really like that. I think there's some cool stuff. I, so what interests you? Um, you? You know, if you're in a business and, and you're inside a company some doing this for somebody else's company, 
he should still be something you interest you're interested in but knowing you don't have quite the same flexibility as you do as a as an entrepreneur when it's your business and your business's point should be something that you're interested in right but and it's okay um uh i used to work for a company called robin's joya and they arguably invented the program management uh, industry in fact pmi was an early partner of theirs and a lot of the pm body of knowledge was built around Robin Stroya's methodology of program management. They really were the first firm to, to bring that in, in a commercial way from a consulting, project management consulting. Now it's everybody has it. PMI has made it a bit of a commodity. Um, I still argue it's not a commodity, but you can get trained on it pretty quickly, take a test and you're an expert. Um, so, so either way, that that is a market invention that Robin Stroya created with program management, and now it's more of an industry. You kind of argue maybe it was a mega trend. It definitely goes across industries, but it really was an industry in itself. And that's where you think about what a market invention is. Many ways you are creating an industry in itself. So, so as we're moving along, I want to show you. So, so for the presentation or presentation of this, bringing this together. I am going to use salesforce.com as an example, and I'm not going to use salesforce.com today as an example. I'm going to use it when they were in 1999 or say they were looking at this in 1997 or 1995 when, when, um, uh, when Mark Benioff, their CEO, founder and CEO, was deciding and, and he was still working for Oracle and Larry Ellison trying to decide on what he was going to do next. So I was in was not there in the room. I have read a lot. I've done a lot of research on Salesforce.com, uh, how they thought, what they did. It is a true a market invention company. They definitely did this. The Behind the Cloud by Mark Benioff is a great, great book. That's worth uh, watching or watching reading. Uh, but I am going to do my best to put that in context because it's a real world example and they've been successful. So you can see it kind of materialized in what it is today. Um, so if you were, if you were Mark Benioff back in 1999, when really, when they started, these were the mega trends. So let's go back in our time machine here and talk about these. So, so the first one is the internet. You know, for those who are are younger and were born, you know, uh, in the late '80s or in the '90s, even you never you never known an existence without without the internet. Uh, but the internet was was emerging then, and it's still emerging. But it was certainly emerging then. Uh, with that cloud, it, it's funny. The cloud market was actually coined by IBM, I believe. Feel feel free to fact check me. And IBM is another market inventor and you can see them invent markets all the time. And the one they were really pushed pushing on for a while was the cloud. And the cloud was just basically the internet and software as a service. And they wanted to push cloud consulting for digital transformation and all that stuff that we take for granted today. But at the time it was just this emerging idea of what the cloud was. And I remember presentations, doing presentations and having to teach people um, what the cloud was, right? And these weren't baby boomers that were in, in these executive seats. In some ways they were, but there was, the, you know, their parents were running companies still. So my grandparents and such. So anyways, yeah, it was, it was fun. Customer experience was a big trend and it had been for the past 10, 15 years. It, it, it catches momentum per industry because different industries are at different stages of maturity. Uh, but customer experience, if it's coming to your industry and, it, and your industry is talking about it like is it's everything since sliced bread, well, know that you are a laggard and, and it was cool back in 1999. I'm not shaming you or judging you. Just be aware, okay? It doesn't mean it's still not important. Customer experience is extremely important. But And, and how to differentiate through customer experience is, is, is major also. It's just not a mega trend anymore. It's a It's a... Uh, I would say it's it's keeping up with the Joneses. Okay, and then now we're moving to broadband. So broadband, 1999, AOL was still rocking it. AOL with you know you've got mail and and half the po U.S. population thought the AOL navigator was the only way was the internet itself. I remember that conversation, and and uh, but broadband, uh, you know. 
UUNet, and I'm not sure if they had merged to WorldCom at that point, but UUNet was building all over the world. It was this race to broadband, to high-speed internet, and uh, it was exciting. So, so broadband was just the mega trend. Uh, people were still using 56k modems. Mobility, um, that was cell phones, like Blackberries, were king of the world back then, right? The iPhone didn't even exist. So, uh, and it was this new thing that was hitting all CIOs. It was like, oh, mobility. We got to be mobile, mobility, mobility. And then this weird thing called Y2K, the end of the world in 2000, right? The internet, the, all of our computers were going to turn off or come and try to attack us because there was some code of, they didn't put uh, the right date dates in the code and it would reset to, I believe it was, correct me if I'm wrong, to 1900 once we passed the 2000 mark, meaning people didn't change the clock to think that we would ever exist past 2000. So no 2001. And so if you're in Y2K consulting, man, it was like it, it, people were throwing money at you at that point. Anyways, just to the point, people used the Y2K mega trend to build a consulting and IT practices that still exist today. Now they're not consulting on Y2K anymore, but at the time that was that was top of mind for most CIOs. Now, and then offshoring. It, it's ironic that we're kind of going back to inshoring now, but offshoring was a thing. The call centers in India or other low cost, low cost labor markets, manufacturing in China was just getting started back in 1999. Now we're decoupling from China. Now you can see how cycles happen, but offshoring was a big deal. And, and a lot of people made, I mean, trillions of dollars uh, aligning their businesses to offshoring. And then corporate giving. Now, corporate giving just seems intuitive and it should be something everybody does, right? You know, the point of giving is just the point of giving. That's the gift itself. But um, it was new and not Many, if at all, companies really had it part of baked into their revenue model itself. It was always a, a later, like after the fact, like once we make money, then we'll donate some to our local charities or employees' charities, uh, stipends, that kind of thing. But now uh, with corporate giving, it's, it's, it's part of your business model. But at the time, that was an emerging megatrend. And, and, and that's the other part. When you're looking at these megatrends, it's not just you know, you can look at the emerging ones like, oh, what will be big in 2060 or or 2080 even if we want to go way out uh, or 2050, but but or near term 2030. I would think of it as more of a near term. What are the mega trends today? Um, because if you you're looking at mega trends that are going to become well talked about mega trends by say 2050 or so. Depending on your time horizon, uh, you could do this, but know that you're not going to get adoption. For you're going to be in a, a, a slog for a longer period of time because that mega trend isn't. You can't leverage that mega trend in the traction that allows you to leverage as far as the conversation. It's quick, like if Y2K was an issue and it was identified back in 1990, those consulting firms may have gone out there and say, hey, we're Y2K, you got 10 years. But they would have been way too early. They would have been too early. And in fact, they would have been, they would have probably been would have been out of business because they would have never made it to the rush, the gold rush itself of Y2K, which really was probably started, I feel like it started in 1997 to 1998. So give those that hopefully gives you an idea about how I use and, and the team uses mega trends to align timing on messaging, where the market opportunity is. So that that's critically important. Now, now, so so these are the things that Mark Benioff could have identified or not, and maybe he wasn't, you know, thinking about this in this this level of detail. Um, either way, it worked. But if for this is is a framework, and it, and it allows you to critically think through the process and align to it. So these are the mega trends. So, so if you're watching this and you're jotting this down, just think of some mega trends that you guys may have. You can you can use the previous slide, which are these, or you can go out to those those sites and find some more for you. Okay, now that we've got the mega trends down, now it's time to talk about our strengths. 
these are your strengths or my strengths if I'm writing this down. And and the strengths are, are this. It, it can be, you know, traditionally people think of strengths in a business sense, like a SWOT analysis, something that the team and I debate on all the time and the effectiveness of SWOTs. I, I really don't love SWOTs, to be honest, because I think SWOTs are obsolete in some ways when you do this. Uh, because, you know, if you're going to focus on a weakness, which you shouldn't, you should not focus on a weakness. In fact, weaknesses are not weaknesses. They're really fears. Um, well, a strength can be a weakness if you overuse the strength, right? Or use it in the wrong setting. And the other part, a weakness, generally speaking, is a fear. And a fear is something to overcome because there's a belief system there. And if you don't overcome that belief system of that fear or that weakness in your own mind, then it will continue to sabotage you. So it's important to identify them, but not as a weakness, but really more of a fear of something happening. Because when anybody who has done a lot of SWATs and done a lot of weaknesses around those time, uh, you look five years from then after the fact, like 99% of the, none of those uh, fears or weaknesses, even if you did put in a process or something to overcome it, it generally don't, don't come up. So because nobody has a crystal ball. So again, so your strengths, going back to your strengths, why we only care about strengths here. We don't care about the other part of the SWAT. It's it's about opportunities. It's not about uh, sabotaging yourself with fears, right? How you can't do it. So strengths are how you can do it and what you can leverage. So it's a belief system. So if your company or you have a strong belief system that you believe aligns to the mega trends, put it here, put it down. And and there's some ideas here that I'll I'll, I'll throw up there and we'll use Salesforce.com as an, a working example after this as well. The relationships. So whatever relationships. You people talk about your network is your net worth. Don't fully agree with that, but it is a good guiding principle to the fact that this is your network. Who can you reach out with? Who do you have strength? Do you have advisors? Do you have investors? Do you have uh, subject matter experts? This is your team. Like, do you have a makeup of quality that allows you to do things? And and these relationships matter. Awareness. So. Uh, a lot of people ask like, okay, at a market invention, how long does it take? And I always say, hey, well, it depends on your awareness and uh, the mega trends and the timing. There's a few angles here. But, but most importantly, the more aware, if you're a salesforce.com today, it takes, you already have awareness as a strength. So anything you promote or push out there, everyone in the industry is going to see it. And everybody's going to pay attention to it. You're going to have analysts and influencers cover the discussion. They're going to criticize you. They're going to call you, the, you know, the, again, the smartest person in the world. If they love you, what have you. Um, and so when you launch something new or try to invent a new market, when you're already an established, well-known leader, it's much easier and it's much shorter period of time. I mean, you can see Apple invent markets overnight because then because they are Apple, meaning everybody is paying attention to them. And for good reason, right? Uh, now, if you don't have awareness, that is not a strength because it can be a strength, meaning you're not tied with the baggage of the leader. Um, if you are a leader, you have baggage and there's pain, you are creating pain and you could create an, an entire new market with your existence, which the government has done multiple times, by the way. And other large software companies have done too. Uh, but uh, but again, back to timing, again, awareness, uh, you know, you're going to have to ramp up. So with, you have a lot of awareness. It's faster timing. When you don't have a lot of awareness, you've got to be more patient or have a lot more money. One of the two. Okay. So personal skills are definitely a strength. Those are, I am a good writer. I am a good presenter. I am a good uh visual artist it could be I'm a good programmer uh i'm a good teacher i'm a good these are your strengths put them down make sure you're clear on them and put them on here your personal skills and strengths are really important and these personal skills i will make the differentiator between personal skills versus technical school technical skills personal skills are uh uh, you know, your, your communication skills, your, I would call them like your edge skills, uh, 
your ability to listen, your ability to take complex ideas and put them together. Uh, so these are the soft skills you would argue. Some people would argue. I call them. I've called them personal or the edge skills, the things that you can't learn in a school, right, or a technical school or training um, in a technical way. And then there's the technical skills. So that's the am I good coder? Am I a good visual artist? Am I a good financial person, right? Can I look at numbers and crunch numbers really well? All those matter. I think selling is kind of a blend of the two, but but there's a lot of technical skill that goes along with selling. But if your sales skills want to focus on that, I, I would call that a, more of a technical skill. Your personal skills are more your interpersonal, your uh, the way you carry yourself, your communication skills, that kind of stuff. And then we move to customer experience. Uh, you know, that's a strength. If you have your existing company and you have an incredible customer experience or something in the customer experience itself that you do uniquely, definitely put that down here. And then contract vehicles for those friends of mine who are in the government business. Um, obviously, contract vehicles are important. They're not everything, but without them, it's hard, really hard for the government to buy from you. So it's kind of important. And they, they them in themselves can stop from competitors from uh, selling the same product or service that you sell. So contract vehicles are really are a strength. And, uh, and you, they have them in, in the, you know, enterprise side also, obviously large enterprises have contract vehicles with vendors and partners, but, um, uh, you really see it more in honestly, it as a real strength strength because in the commercial side, you can overcome contract vehicles with, a, with a market invention. You won't need a contract vehicle. They don't create, they will actually create one for you. Um, the purchasing team. For this, in fact, they will do it for the government side. Also, it takes a little bit more work, but they will sole source a contract for you if you do marketing invention properly. And then security clearances for those again who are in that uh, security sensitive type of environment. That is just another example of strengths. So there's and there's other types, probably categories that I'm, we're not talking about here. Just you get the idea, and I wanted to be exhaustive in in sharing what that is right so then we're moving to you know mark benioff strengths and and again i wasn't in the room with him but i could tell you what they is really clear in everything we've read and and you can see it and uh, and i used to do keynotes at dreamforce their large uh, salesforce.com conference which is huge it all of the hotel rooms sell out in San Francisco Bay Area when Dreamforce is is going on. In fact, they had to bring a cruise ship in a couple of years ago to for the over capacity um, of people. People were sleeping on a cruise ship because there were no hotel rooms left. Amazing, right? So, and it's just power of market invention. So, you know, Mark Benioff's no software vision was was a a big thing. Now, did he have that? Before going through this process, I argue yes, because he saw it when he was at Oracle and he saw it in many ways. Um, Larry Ellison was absolutely a strength. I'm sure he wrote that down at the time um, because Larry Ellison was one of the early investors. And Larry Ellison was, you know, and is the CEO of Oracle. Uh, ironically, their number one competitor, Tom, you know, Siebel Systems, which is Tom Siebel, was, was the founder of that also worked at one point for Larry Ellison. So interesting, right? Uh, Mark Benioff also had software sales experience. And, and if you're going to get into enterprise software uh, and you have used to run all the enterprise software for Oracle, I would say that's a pretty good technical skill or and, and, and or soft skill combined, right? So that's worth it. Uh, also his experience with relational databases. Yeah, Oracle was the first relational database or company built on relational databases. And, and ironically, you know, you look at salesforce.com, really all it is is a relational database with a front end, easier to use interface. So it is just a relational database. And he knows that. So he had the technical knowledge, maybe not to code it, but understood the, where to find the people, the talent, the resources, and the scope and the functionality that would allow him to build something on top of that. And he had a really good, last but not least, he had a really good point of no legacy infrastructure, right? So he didn't have to worry about, um, you know, just just having to upgrade things. Uh, because you got to remember, 
on premise was the norm prior to that. So uh, it would be like, it, in many ways, it's it's like somebody that built their whole company being on analog and having to go digital suddenly. It's like all the technology and everything. It's like the lighting companies uh, that you know with the incandescent light bulb, which was was uh, off a different an old power grid system, which was off the Tesla power grid, and then going and which was really a, a electrical engineers, right, and engineering. And then going to the LED, the light emitting diode and LED technology, that was all electronic engineers. So companies like Philips had no engineers that knew how to do LEDs when LEDs came out, right? Can you imagine your entire industry? You do not have the expertise to design the future of your own industry. So they partnered. But just as an example, that's that's a strength that when you don't have the legacy infrastructure to sell, manage, upgrade clients, you can just jump in and leapfrog. That is a huge advantage. Okay. So now when we get into pain here, um, I have it all written down, but let's just jump into this. So the circles are the, say, the number of people that said this. So when you're, when you're researching pain, you, you can do a few things, you know, when you're researching pain, uh, I think it, I think it's really important to get external advice that's outside necessarily the industry experts and influencers because we're not looking for the in industry experts to, to give us this information yet. That's after it. We want them to confirm it or or identify things maybe we missed in our research. But ideally, if you can, you're going to ask questions from buyers or potential buyers on this. So you're not drinking your own Kool-Aid, you're going out and doing external research. And, and I always recommend a mix of doing a broader survey, digital survey, like using something like SurveyMonkey in questions, and and, and you can find ten, plenty of partners that will do this for you. Uh, Merit will obviously do this with you or for you, but, but even out there, there's plenty of research partners that will facilitate and get you that group, get you to the number of people that, who are you going to send this list to, right? If you're an existing business, you can ask some of your existing customers. That's great. You should do that anyways. Uh, and, and the questions that we're asking is are, are a little bit different than maybe what we're used to in the past. So now in the data audit, if you have customer satisfaction research, all of that stuff should be thought about and you should dig through that when you get to this point. So that's where the data audit research is. You have, if you do a customer satisfaction index survey, or do you do a net promoter score or, or any of that, if you have, you know, anything that feedback from sales team and their customers about what's working and what's not working, like those are good things to, to put in here and not, not only things that are not working. So this is a pain. So this is not like, Oh, we're doing this well, this is all pain. So be careful. When you ask your customers, they're like, what are we doing really badly? You know, and, and a couple of reasons, people are nice and they're not going to necessarily tell you the truth um, because they don't want to hurt your feelings uh, or make it weird with, with their interactions with you. So just be aware of that. Uh, so a couple ways to ask these questions. And there's tons of ways to design the surveys and write these questions. And, and I am not a professional research researcher. I do research all the time. I guess maybe I am professional at it, but I don't script the questions quite as masterfully as somebody that just does that every day. Right. And again, we have people and there's plenty of tons of people out there. If you just look at it on LinkedIn, that can help you on this stuff. So, but the, the point of the questions are going to be like, um, uh, what is what are the the can you list the three worst things when working with uh working or buying in this industry or buying from this company or buying from you or you you're really just trying to get specific things that are and you can ask them in multiple ways of what did you have a positive experience what, you know what was positive about it great what were the what was bad what could they do better uh, if you have one recommendation to improve something, what would it be? Um, what do you think are the biggest gaps in the industry today? 
What you know, these kind of questions are the questions that you want. You want to get a heart in the middle of that pain that you're looking at here. So go back, expand this so you can see it better. So, you know, when, when you know, again, I was not interviewing there, but this is uh, this is a good sort of format um, that that you can certainly do here. Um, and and with that, I would say we first is not enough sales revenue. Sorry, we're getting a little bit of spam on the uh, live chat. And I was just fixing it up here. Uh, so so one would be not enough sales revenue. That's a pretty common, I think that's still pain today for CRM. So again, you're looking to build something in the customer relationship management space, this is the way to go, right? So not enough sales revenue, okay, pretty common. Everybody probably said that. If we had 30 people, 30 people probably would have said that. Maybe 27 people said customer data hard to track, but the majority, okay. Contract fees are high. Definitely was a pain back then. I think it is still a pain if it's ironic that uh, we replaced Siebel with Salesforce because people would argue that Salesforce.com's fees are too high. Uh, CRM hard to integrate. I, again, you got to remember we are, we would not have the cloud. We did not have software as a service. So, and we didn't have these APIs and the App Store and all of that stuff that we take for granted for now. Now, in multiple ways, uh, but but it was it was it was. It was siloed. The, an application trying to plug in a CRM to to other applications in the business enterprise was very difficult. Accurate sales forecasting, again, pretty common. Doesn't still a problem today with most organizations. Uh, version upgrading was difficult. Yes, absolutely. Version upgrading. Got to remember, there was no cloud, so it wasn't like there was just this software as a service. And you know, it, once they changed it in the mothership. Everything was changed on your computer when you logged in on the web. No, if you wanted to upgrade or, or add new functionality, you literally had to install it per machine and uninstall, then reinstall. Like it, a, lot, a lot of people forget that. Uh, so the versioning, up, version upgrading, versioning was difficult. Remote login while traveling. Uh, that's another one common today. Okay, big issue again. Mobility. Sales teams are mobile. If they're in the office or and not on the phone, they're not selling. They're not doing in, out there. You know, um, unless you're you're only selling through the phone. Many would argue, sales leaders especially, that salespeople shouldn't be in the office. You know, they should only be in the office to check in. And back in the day, when when before Salesforce.com was in. One of the main reasons they had to come to the office was to upload and update, get on premise so that they could update all of their their accounts, spreadsheets and everything else and, and submit them because they couldn't do it in mobility. And imagine mobility is this thing and in, in, in this big issue and you can't you're not mobile and the salespeople should be mobile. Um, and then neat lead tracking, of course, that's still one of the biggest challenges today in CRMs is lead tracking needs to improvement. How do we track it? Who do we give uh, the benefit to? So, which, you know, um, attribution, which is where do we attribute this to? Is it a marketing lead? Is it a sales lead in marketing? Which uh, which activity generated this lead to elevate it? Was it, you know, so how did we attribute all of this and, and where, who does it go to? When does it go to them? And that kind of thing. So that's that automation side as well. So, so, you know, when you go through this and you find that you're going to get a list of answers, right. And, and, the, and they're all going to be mashed up and, you know, you're gonna have to cipher, you know, cipher through this and just decipher all of this, meaning, Go through and start saying, and, and these are themes, right? People will use different sentences and words to describe these themes, but it is your job to go through it and say, okay, these are organized, these are organized, and organize and group them into these groupings of like pains, and then label them with the theme. And and the number, only the numbers really four is just to show you what how important it was or how often it came up. Okay, so you know these are arbitrary numbers. You know, say thirty out of thirty said lead tracking needs improvement. I can just tell you that from implementing CRMs uh, most of my professional career, that is one of the top priorities still today. 
right? All right. So after we get these pain, you're almost there. It's awesome. We're almost there. And, and, uh, and I know we're going to go probably over an hour, but I think it's important. And for those who have to hop off at, at, the, at the top of the hour, it's quite all right. We'll keep recording. You can come back and watch the rest. I don't want to stop it here, though. So, so now that we got the pain, it's now about mapping the competitors to where they are, right? And I'm going to show you how to do that. But basically what we're doing is we're going to go out and look on, you know, uh, look on their websites. You get first, you got to identify the competitors. If you don't know who the competitors are and you're creating something brand new, like you have a hypothesis and there really isn't a, uh, a competitor because they're not doing what you do, then you should look at indirect competitors. So are you replacing something that exists today? Uh, meaning, uh, Airbnb, Airbnb really had no competitors, right? But they did indirectly with hotels. And and so so you would see hotels up here because there really wasn't another business model that was even remotely similar to that. Maybe there is, I I, I don't know, but but at the time, I would argue that probably Hilton and all these other models would probably be in, in that space as far as what they're doing. Um, but if you don't have a competitor, then try to find the closest alternative of what you're replacing today. And, uh, and so right here, there's really three primary ones. Ironically, Oracle was one of them. Uh, Larry Elson was funding his competitors, which is fine. He doesn't care. SAP and Siebel. Siebel does not exist anymore. They were actually bought by Oracle. So, uh, and SAP does still have that. So when we're on an SAP and you can see we mapped out, what we're looking is seeing, and we'll go out here to the internet here right now. And and I'm going to go back and we're going to dive, in, dive into uh, SAP. So now we're on SAP's, uh, it's big, SAP's a big company based out of Germany. They do ERPs, enterprise resource planning. Obviously, for a long time, you couldn't integrate into SAP. They were one of the hard people to integrate your CRM to. So they bought a CRM solution or in slash built it and made it part of their value chain suite. So you can buy everything SAP. Um I'm not going to say that if they're good or bad, but uh, I will say, you know, people that do work with SAP have had challenges as far as slow and, and hard to work with and cumbersome, but uh, still a lot of the world runs on SAP and they're right about that. So CRM software, CX solution. So CX is customer experience. We look here, turn market opportunities into bottom line realities. Okay. Win customer trust and loyalty with intelligent engagement. So again, that's lead, that's engagement, that's life cycle engagement. That is a that was a new thing that was emerging in customer experience after 1999, but it, it is certainly important. Future proof your business and then business models. Okay, let's see, D data, intelligence, CX, customer experience. Okay, it's all about customer experience. Great, they're using that mega trend, but what are they doing about customer experience? That's where you want to get into it, right? So customer experience is is part of this, and I think that could be part of the pain now. You know, I don't have all my customer data in one place. I don't know like tracking all of that stuff. That's what they're they're outlining. So if we had a pain, that that's one of the pains we would identify. And sometimes, um, sometimes you know, you might not get the pain identified but in the interviews. Sometimes there is pain, new pain identified when you're doing the competitive research. Now, let's look at a couple other ones. So let's go to Sugar CRM, which is another competitor. And, and here we go. We talk about prediction, like, uh, you know, pipeline forecasting, right? That's still a, a pain. Automation process accelerate everything no roadblocks because your CRM should work it for you not so that's uh works right out of the box integrations again ease of integrations increase user adoption by letting users work in an environment they're used to working in i mean i think remove friction by working award winning known flexibility this is about mobility you, you can see how they're kind of addressing the pains that the the this table stakes see your customer data in high definition 
So you're starting to outline everything that they're saying. And if you're trying to invent a market, this is the best way to understand where the table stakes are. So this is all table stakes that you've got to do. Now let's look at, um, I do not want to talk to you at Microsoft, but Microsoft Dynamics CRM move to yes faster, accelerate sales pipeline, improve experiences by connecting. Then they're using AI and automation. See, they're trying to leverage these mega trends to show you that how aligned they are. If you're looking for AI, you might want to hire them right? Sales and marketing. They're showing that uh, through AI insights, automate the sales process, sales cycle, increase revenue through automation. You get, you get an idea. Now, now let's look at salesforce.com and how they're looking at it. So salesforce.com, by the way, you notice how once you invent a market, and we talk about this, you move to you move from first place, you know, move from last place to first place in the industry. You go and you go into uh, the sort of lead the market phase. You see other language, the world's number one CRM platform. That's defending the market. That's how. So Salesforce.com, maybe they're not fully aware that they're following the market invention process. Um, however, they are following it, right? So they are moving into a defending the leadership position. And because everybody's trying to say they do what they do or better now at this point. And, and if you go to salesforce.com, I do not want to fill out your sales sheet, but sell smarter, faster, create more engaging marketing, connect every e-commerce integration, better support for customers, easy builds, easy use. You get the idea. So, when we look back here, you start to see at the time when you're going back, and I know this because I was I existed and I was actually purchasing CRM software back in 1999. I actually bought from Salesforce.com because I didn't want on-premise. I wanted cloud-based, which was the whole market shift that they talked about. They shifted people from on-premise market. They even coined that phrase to then to then where we are today. So Siebel Systems and SAP. You know, everybody's talking about not enough sales revenue. Oh, we'll speed up your revenue. We'll make it better. Customer data hard to track. Yeah, we saw that. Everybody's still talking about that. Accurate sales forecasting. Totally. Version upgrading difficult. So now, see, see now if we were to look at it, most of all of this is filled in. But at the time, it was only a few of these were filled in. So you can start to see, okay, now this is where they're having the conversation. So th this is where the competitors are saying, this is where the value is. This is what we're doing. But the issue is they are causing, contract fees was caused by SAP and Siebel. CRM Harnett, that's their issue. They caused that. Version upgrade, they caused that. Remote logging, they caused that. Of course, they're not going to focus on that because that belief system was, those issues around that belief system, that pain was caused by these guys, right? So that's a huge opportunity for you guys, for everyone in any industry. So now, so now if we look at, and these are just some examples here, if we were to go out and look at media companies and what they're looking at, right? So then this is what people are writing about. This is the influencer side. So, so when we talked about before, this is the competitors. Now we're going to jump into the influencers and the influencers are two things. There's mega influencers and then there's industry influencers. And please don't confuse the two because a mega influencer is like an Oprah Winfrey, right? Um, they span industries. Now, those are mega influencers. Industry influencers are industry analysts, people write editors for an industry publication like CIO, magazine, that kind of stuff, Fast Company, um, like these kind of things. It's funny. Uh, uh, I think it was Business 2.0. I don't even know if that even exists anymore, but that was a big pub publication back in the day. I think they probably were acquired. So, so when we look at these publications, okay, okay, this is where they are. And the reason why they are usually in the same place as the competitors are, because where do you think they're getting their, their articles written? First, the competitors are pushing these topics, right? Oh, you need to write on this. These are the five things that are important. So you get their, their media companies or their PR people internally pitching fast company, computer world, watching technology about accurate sales forecasting. But they're also the other way around because since they're the leaders, the media likes to cover the leaders. 
So where do you see the future, SAP? Well, SAP has a great opportunity to project, project their point of view and their position. So again, great PR tool for those who are building content. Anybody who's in the media, this is probably one of the best media landscape tools there exists um, because you get to the heart of what is not being talked about, but is a clear pain. So, and, and again, part of what market invention is, is identifying the gaps of the pain and then transitioning the legacy market conversations to the new one. So guess what you do when you're talking about, and you're in media, yeah, you can talk about accurate sales forecasting, but SAP, Siebel, and Oracle are already talking about it. Nobody's talking about these guys. The contra contract fees are high. CRM's hard to integrate, remote login when traveling. Great opportunity to talk about mobile capabilities, about how mobile's the future. Here's some mobile statistics, da 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 Back in 1999, believe me, that would have gotten media coverage. CRM hard to integrate. This is why we're doing the, this app exchange. Da, 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 da. So you guys get the idea. So this becomes the, the opportunity where these guys are. Not enough sales, customer data hard to track, accurate sales forecasting, version upgrading difficult, and lead tracking needs improvement. That is table stakes. That is status quo level work, meaning you have to do this. But it will not gain market share if you do this. Now, it might based on if you make it cheaper, faster, whatever, but it's not going to give you the big leap in, in the traction that you're looking and it's certainly not going to invent a market because you're just following what they're saying is the problem and the pain at the center of their market. And, and again, I'm going to real quickly hop over here to just the CIO, just to share with you so everyone sees what we're looking at here. We go back to, you know, we'll go to CIO magazine, you know, you go into their IT leadership and, and look what they're talking about. You know, we could pull in, put in CRM in here, you know, disrupts disappointments, product-based IT, a blueprint for success. Okay. Product-based IT. Well, who's driving the product-based IT? New US appointments. Th these guys are really good at looking at this stuff. So you can look at CRM. And let's see if it'll open up it fast quickly here. Here we go. Effective implementations, six, six CRM predictions for 2016. Obviously, this is in the past because CRM is past the hype cycle as far as in many ways. Um, but my only point is here, tips for achieving CRM, 10 signs of CRM needs an overhaul. We go here, poor data quality, broken add-ons. You can see the same themes that they're writing about, right? Your in-house CRM system is brittle and sucking up resources. New sales leadership has a new CRM priorities that one CRM expert leaves. Integrations are more manual than effective. This, this allows you to start really uncovering these gaps, right? So... Let me just remove, go back here to our presentation. All right. So get the idea. We want to we wanna see where everything else, there's some going to be some outliers, sure. But most of the time, the same publications are going to be covering the same thing as the leaders. And, and here's the point on if you do find them vision, say they're talking about version upgrading difficult at the time. Well, be aware if they haven't talked about a company, a company is pitching that to them. Meaning if you were to jump in and say, okay, that's, we're going to build it, everything on version upgrading difficult. It's a great opportunity. The media companies are talking about it, but no competitors are great. Just remember the media companies do generally speaking, do not have the original ideas. So they will have to research and resources. So they're researching and getting this from somebody. And chances are it's one of the leaders and they're setting the stage for then coming in and promoting it and everything else. In the industry world on media and PR, on the business to business side and the consumer side, they say there's more separation between media buying and, and journalism but I'd argue there isn't. There's always a conflict of interest inside because all the advertising pays for <laughs> the articles. So 
but it's even even the the separation is even a thinner in the b2b context meaning if you're promoting and advertising with them they are going to give you a priority for publishing in, in articles or at least having the chance to, to put a byline or a, a quote in an article that they're developing. All right. So as we, as we keep going, that gets us there. So, so the last but not least, what I want to share and we're 10 minutes over here is these are the gaps. So now you've mapped opportunities. You get a clear picture of the landscape. You can identify the gaps where they are, where you need to play to keep up with the Joneses, to be relevant, but then where are the opportunities for you to create gaps and, and become the market leader? And how you organize these things, which we'll share in future episodes, in, in, in mapping and prioritizing and, and past the mapping stage and what do we do with this, that's what we'll get into the next time, um, allows you to basically see a crystal ball. This is, I mean, I have never heard or seen anybody build something like this before. And, and, and I did it for my own sanity when I was trying to, when I was always a challenger brand. So this allowed me to map content, identify con new content opportunities, new positioning, but even better, new markets. And, and so if you're a marketer or CEO and you're not using a tool like this, then you have a, a, a major deficiency from somebody who is. And again, this is a gift to everybody who's excited about building markets like I am and at Merit, uh, but I hope this was helpful. And this is how you get to your opportunities. And, and, and lastly, and we'll get into this in the next episode, when you have it all mapped out, this is when you start looking at your strengths and you look at the mega trends. Like, these are my strengths. These are the industry pains. These are the mega trends. How do I leverage these mega trends, these technologies or these shifts to impact and solve these niche pains within a broader pain ecosystem than this bigger market that we're inventing? And that's a whole brainstorming session. Um, but at least this gives you the framework where you can start to marry and map up and start to align to have that conversation with you for yourself. And, and I, and I, and when it gets into that sort of creativity of identifying the opportunities themselves and listing them, um, you know, it's about the, your brain connections, right. And identifying those, the synops, synapses and having them connect and like, wow, I got that idea. We're pulling down from universal intelligence if, if you're on that karmic uh, capitalism level. But uh, but what you will be surprised with how many ideas come for you and it's much easier for you to overcome that sort of idea idea generation. But always when you come up with ideas, make sure you're, you're looking and basing them back on these facts because um, these are your opportunities. And whoever solves these pains within these gaps, and a lot of these pains are being created by the incumbents, the industry incumbents themselves, that really gives you the opportunity to invent something special. So with that, I hope I hope everyone enjoyed this. I, I enjoyed sharing this with you. There's so much more to get into on market invention. And this is just, again, scratching the surface on, on market opportunity mapping and mapping opportunities. And I hope this tool is helpful for you all as it's been extremely helpful for me and been helpful for the clients we work with as in creating major opportunities for themselves and as, as companies and individuals. So again, thanks everyone for joining. That concludes our, our market invention series covering mapping market opportunity. Again, my name is Adam Vasquez from Merit. And thank you for everyone for joining me. Please take care. Have a glorious day.